Thank you to everyone who took part by submitting an entry as we received lots of amazing entries from all dental schools. I now have the pleasure of introducing our three finalists for the clinical case competition, who are all in their fourth year of dental school. In no particular order, our finalists are Krishan Pandya, Sven Butson, and Amber Ahmed. Our three finalists have all submitted a five minute pre-recorded video, which will be played and followed by a live two minutes of Q&A from a master in restorative dentistry, Dr. Shiraz Khan. The winner will, will receive a 50 pound prize. I will now start by playing Krishan Pandya's submission from the University of Newcastle. Hi everyone, my name is Krish and I'm a fourth year dental student at Newcastle University. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of my patients. So this patient is a 46 year old male who works as a chef. He's medically fit and well and his first appointment with me was back in November. He presented complaining of pain and these were his exact words. After taking a pain history, this is what I found out. Pain from the lower right quadrant, which began in August, it first started as a short, sharp pain and now becoming a dull ache. It sometimes radiated along the right side of his mandible, and there was some associated swelling, discharge, and bad taste back in October, but this has since cleared up. The pain was worse at night and with cold air and drinks, and he ranked it a 9 out of 10 on the pain scale. After the pain history, I moved on to my initial examination. Extraorally, nothing of note, and intraorally, looking at the soft tissues first. The gingiva had slight erythema and edema, indicating gingival disease, but other than that, the soft tissues were fine. Looking at the hard tissues, the patient had a partly restored adult dentition, a lot of plaque and fair bit of cal calculus, so poor oral hygiene. Specifically looking at that lower right quadrant now, the lower right eight extraction site had fully healed and the socket had fully epithelialized. The lower right seven had an MO amalgam, but there was evidence of leaking and ditching around the margin. The lower right six and five had no evident pathology. After that, I took a quick chart and a BP. The chart shows all the eights missing, uh, partly restored adult dentition, and the BPE is all twos and threes with vocation involvement in the lower right sexton. A quick occlusal examination showed a class one size relationship, and on protrusion, there was even contacts in the upper two to two and posterior disclusion. On lateral excursion, both sides exhibited canine guidance. However, the important takeaway here is that on the left lateral excursion, there was non working side guidance of the upper right and lower right seven. I then decided to do some special tests. The lower right seven is TTP positive, sensitive to cold air from the three in one and grade one mobile. The lower right six and five were TTP negative and not sensitive to cold air from the three in one. So I requested a periapical radiograph of the lower right seven, which is shown here. Sorry, I know it's not the best image, but my photography skills still need a bit of work. So this is the PA of the lower right seven. Uh, it was grade one. Um, teeth present are lower right seven, six and five. There's periapical pathology present on the lower right seven and radiolucency underneath the restoration. So the diagnosis of this lower right seven was irreversible pulpitis and symptomatic apical periodontitis. After explaining all of this to the patient, the three treatment options I presented were one, do nothing two, extraction, and three, root canal treatment. We discussed the pros and cons of each option, and he consented for option three. I then got the patient back in on my next available AGP session to begin the treatment. The RCT was split into two sessions. And in session one, first administered, administered some local anesthetic and placed my rubber dam, isolating the lower right seven. Then I drove out the amalgam, removed the secondary carries underneath, and this allowed me to access the pulp chamber and the three root canals. I clipped one end of my apex located to the patient's cheek and the other end to my TEN file to find out the working length of the three canals. And once I'd done that, I took a working length radiograph. Again, sorry, I know it's not the best image. I then used my 15 and 20 files to create a glide path and then went in with my protape files to fully shape and clean the canal, all the while irrigating with sodium hypochlorite. And I've also attached a really useful link here for an article um, comparing root canal irrigants. And if you want to have a read of that, just scan it with the camera on your phone. Once I'd done that, I took a master GP radiograph and finally I temporized the tooth, placing non-setting calcium hydroxide um, into the canals and sealing it over with GIC. So session two of the RCT was a couple of weeks later. I numbed the tooth up again and placed my rubber dam, removed the GIC calcium hydroxide and dried the canals ready for obturation. To obturate the canals, uh, it used a combination of cold lateral condensation and warm vertical condensation. And here's another link to a great article comparing gutta percha technique, gutta percha condensation techniques. But the summary of it is basically that uh, warm vertical condensation gives more homogeneous root fillings. 
Once the cars were filled, I cut back the GP and took a post-op radiograph. And because I was running out of time in my AGP session, I didn't have time to place a definitive restoration. So I just covered the root canals and cotton wool again and placed another GIC. So this is the post-op radiograph of the root filling. Unfortunately, we can't see both medial canals because I couldn't get the annulation right, but the root filling looks homogenous and it's to an appropriate length. In terms of treatment, I still need to do, um, I need to get the patient back in to replace the GIC with a definitive restoration. And because this is a posterior root treated tooth, I need to provide cuspal coverage in the form of a crown or an onlay. So thinking about material choice for this, the patient had originally asked if they could have a porcelain restoration on this tooth. But because of that occlusive examination I did right at the start, the lower right seven um, shows non-working side guidance. So porcelain is contraindicated because of the wear it can cause on opposing dentition. And here's another link to a great article about occlusal considerations for extra coronal restorations. And there's a great section on non-working side guidance and interferences. So definitely scan that if you want to have a read. And finally, I need to do some ongoing maintenance uh, managers gingivitis. So reflecting on this case, even though the treatment hasn't been finished yet. Um, so I think it's not a bad endo considering it's my first one, but it's definitely not perfect. As you can see here, there's a void in the coronal aspect of the distal root canal. However, when, it, when I come to place the definitive restoration, I'm planning to place an IL core, which will involve removing some of the GP, which will give the restoration a bit more retention. Thanks very much for listening, guys. If any of you have got any questions, um, feel free to send me an email, drop me a message on Instagram, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Cheers. Thank you for your submission, Krishan. I would now like to invite Dr. Shiraz Khan to ask a few questions. Hi, guys. Um, hi, Krish. Uh, firstly, congratulations. Lovely work. Um, not bad for your first end, though. I have to be honest. It's great work. Really, really lovely. Um, so to first, first question is, um, well, a first remark, really, rather than a question. Fantastic occlusal assessment. I think it's something that's often missed, even in practice. So the fact that you're trying to identify these things is very, very good. Would you like to run me through what would be your decision-making process and why you would consider um, single-stage endo versus two-stage end endo, please? Um, so, well, in an ideal world, it would be nice to just have as much time as you can on an AGP session and just crack on and do some treatment. Yeah. But, um, obviously, if you can't get the canals dry, then you can't really, um, you can't fill the canals. So I think that was part of the reason I was struggling to get the distal canal dry, but then um, I was still getting some blood coming out of the, the apex of it. So yeah, it was nice yeah. to um, put some hypercal in there and just leave that for a, a week, 10 days. And then I think it ended up being three weeks before I managed to get him back in. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, it's, that's really well documented that if you have, if you're unable to dry the canal, then um, you, should, you should not place the GP. Because if there needs to be any exudate that's created through the process, absolutely you need to consider two stage um good um so you then talked about restorability afterwards i very much enjoyed your discussions about why you would or wouldn't consider porcelain uh, i know the paper by dr still very very well and uh, why what what if you, let's say the patient was quite quite forthright about wanting porcelain what could you do to ensure that porcelain wouldn't necessarily create uh, opposing tooth wear? So I think there's studies that have shown that, um, especially in cases like this, you can look at sort of um, removing the factor of that tooth being non-working side guidance. So looking at sort of reorganizing the occlusion. But I think that's quite a drastic step to take just for a single tooth cuspal coverage. So it was just like really having that conversation with the patient and just saying that porcelain isn't really an option because he was so keen to keep his teeth and I didn't want to damage any of the other ones. but. I think you can sort of look at um, reducing the height of the preparation and just ensuring that it's almost not in occlusion, but not forming that non-working side guidance. Yeah, so that's that's fantastic. I mean, you always want, a, you definitely want a, sta a stable static contact, but what you can do is design the cuspal heights to ensure that when they are guiding non-working side, that they're not in contact. Now, something else that you could do, which is I do very, very big work also in my practice, is if it's non-working side, you can restore the contralateral canine with composite as a canine riser. So what that will do is it will disclude the teeth when they're guiding in that way. So there are options out there, but very, very well thought out, a fantastic presentation. Um, I, I'd be very proud if I was you. Great work. 
Thank you. Great work. Thank you for answering those questions, Krishan. I will now play Sven Butson's submission from the University of Central Lancashire. Hello everyone, I'm Sven and this is my periodontal case presentation. I will start with a brief patient profile, then talk about the patient's dental needs, followed by the treatment that I provided, and I will also reflect on the case at the end. My patient is a 62-year-old lady with a history of radiotherapy for breast cancer who suffers from mobility issues due to health factors. She also has type 2 diabetes mellitus and suffers from Crohn's disease, for which she takes various medications. In terms of her social history, my patient doesn't speak English fluently, but a family member was always with her to translate when needed, and my patient never smoked or consumed any alcohol. Her oral hygiene routine consisted of brushing once daily, which was in the morning, and she didn't use any interdent cleaning aids or fluoride mouthwash. On the extra oral examination, I didn't detect anything abnormal. Intraorally, though, the gingiva were red, swollen, and there was loss of stippling, as well as considerable amounts of black and calculus deposits. There was no spontaneous bleeding, and the initial BPE was 3 to 2, and all twos on the lowest. These are the clinical photographs I took at the first appointment. The inflamed gingiva and calculus deposits are clearly visible here. And here we can see the patient's initial plaque and bleeding scores. This is the baseline six point periodontal chart, which shows bleeding and probing at 37 sites with pockets of four millimeters or greater, as well as mobility of the one eight and the low anterior teeth as well as generalized clinical attachment loss. Moving on to the dental needs. The patient's chief complaint was bleeding on brushing that had been going on for several weeks. Clinically, I diagnosed poor oral hygiene and generalized periodontitis stage three, grade B, currently unstable with risk factors of diabetes, Crohn's disease, and polypharmacy. Overall, my patient presented with a moderate risk for caries, a high periodontal risk, but with a low risk for oral cancer. The structure of the treatment plan is shown on the slide. The first step was prevention, followed by extraction of 1.8, removal of supragingival deposits, and periodontal treatment in the form of root surface instrumentation, which was reviewed after three months. The objectives for the prevention appointments included tailoring oral hygiene advice to the patient's specific needs in line with delivering better oral health, assess the toothbrushing technique and provide advice as appropriate, and also to analyze the diet diary together. Over time, we are able to significantly reduce plaque and bleeding scores. The introduction of an electric toothbrush made a massive difference to the patient's oral hygiene though, which was in part due to arthritis. And while there are still plaque deposits in some of the surfaces, the improvement is clearly visible on these photographs. Here I've listed the prevention achievements. The patient was motivated to improve her oral hygiene and took on advice about brushing twice daily as part of her oral hygiene routine. There was no more obvious bleeding on brushing, and the plaque score had halved from 100% to less than 50%. Moving on to periodontal therapy. The main aim was to remove any subgingival plaque retentive factors to enable the formation of long junctional epithelium and encourage healing. At the three month review appointment, another six point periodontal chart was carried out. And this can be seen here. Comparing the initial chart with the three-month review, there was a 51.4% reduction in bleeding on probing sites, an overall reduction in pocket depths, and no more pockets of more than five millimeters. The patient also started using interdental cleaning aids regularly. On reflection, positive aspects about this case are the considerable improvement in oral hygiene, effective communication with the patient, despite the language barrier, and good teamwork. Admittedly, 
Um, these were the first photographs I ever took, and they could definitely be improved. Despite all the achievements, the patient was still classed as having unstable periodontal disease at the three-month review appointment. But further treatment was not possible at the time due to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Last but not least, I'd like to highlight two articles that have recently been published regarding the association of periodontal disease and COVID-19 severity. The studies demonstrate that patients with periodontal disease have a higher risk of suffering serious COVID-19 complications and have a higher mortality rate. But on the other hand, the studies also show that good oral health plays a key role in risk reduction. Thank you all for listening and have a great conference. Thank you for your submission, Sven. I would now like to invite Dr. Shraz Khan to ask a few questions. Hi, Sven. Hope you're well. Um, Hi, yeah. Cracking, cracking work. Uh, lovely presentation style. And I'll tell you what, your, your first photo is a damn sight better than my first photo. So <laughs> <laughs> good job. Good job. Thank um, you. It's really annoying because you just creamed my last question about asking about COVID-19 and um, uh, risk reduction with uh, perio. And um, what I'd like to say is, is you've quite clearly and logically identified that um, oral hygiene and, and prevention is, is, again, a cornerstone of any restorative dentistry. Um, when you are doing the physical process of debridement of the um, the periodontal, the, sort of the subgingival calculus tartar. What significant tissue are you trying to remove? That's the patient's tissue. The, the granulation tissue uh, that's, that's forming in the pockets and then um, encouraging the long junction epithelium. So letting that heal properly, not disturbing it again within three months. Um, so then that we have a chance to reduce further bone loss, essentially. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that's really well documented. That that granulation tissue is persistent in in leading periodontal disease to continue, um, and I think that's not very well understood actually amongst, uh, I mean, even myself for a long time, but also colleagues. Um, if you were if you were considering a um, this patient obviously had uh, communication difficulties. Yeah. Um, so, what was your mechanism for trying to describe? how they should be undertaking their oral hygiene. Do they have a, is there any way you got around that or? Um, so the patient always brought her um, daughter-in-law with her. She was able to translate in part, um, but I, because translation is not always the same as actually directly speaking to the patient, I tried to do a lot of tell, show, do, and actually I'd show the patient how it should be done in her mouth and then let her demonstrate and um, then review the same thing a couple months later, and just to see how she's getting on. And as we saw on the slides, there was an initial reduction in the um, plaque score, but then it picked up again. So that just means the patient was able to do it for a couple of weeks. Then whether she lost motivation or this, the skill wasn't quite right, then we could see it pick up. So then I suggested if she would be able to use an electric toothbrush, especially because of her arthritis issues, she had problems getting into all the areas of her mouth. And then with the electric toothbrush, she was really able to improve her oral hygiene because it didn't really depend on her manual dexterity anymore. It was more about just getting the toothbrush there and then that would do the cleaning for her. You know, and uh, because there are inherent problems with, and, and we have to deal with this day to day in practice, there are inherent problems with people that are um, uh, uh, bringing family members because you can't actually quantify or validate the translation yeah. process. But that being said, 75% of communication is nonverbal anyway. So yeah. tell show do is exactly what I was asking for. Um, congratulations on a, on a fantastic presentation. Very, very great work. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you in, in the world of dentistry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for answering those questions, Sven. I will now play Amber Ahmed's submission from the University of Manchester. Problems. Hello everybody, my name is Amber and I'm a fourth year dental student studying here at the University of Manchester. So today my clinical case is going to be discussing my mesial occlusal distal cavity with amalgam preparation and restoration on my lower left seven tooth. 
which is shown here. Why do dentists use amalgam? Well, amalgam has been around for a very long time, over 100 years, so it's got a very proven track record of working. It is a very controversial material. Now, the main problems with mercury is that um, the environmental problems, for example, it raises questions such as where do we dispose of it, uh, as well as aesthetic problems. The Marta Treaty, which is essentially a global environmental treaty, which is aimed at lowering the release of mercury into the environment. So that really changed the ball game. But for this clinical case, I chose amalgam for lots of reasons. One of those is because a lot of the patients that we do see will have amalgam restoration so it's really important to know what the material is like to work with. Now why would I choose to place amalgam over risen composite? Few factors. So for example patient factors such as a patient with a high caries rate or local factors to really take into account for for example, subgingival margins. Here's a Cochrane systematic review which compared the tooth coloured fillings compared with amalgam fillings for permanent teeth at the back of the mouth. Results suggest that composite fillings were twice as likely to fill compared with amalgam fillings when used for filling posterior permanent teeth. Let's start the clinical case off. So the armamentarium, which is essentially all the equipment that I will need. And luckily I have labelled it all here in numbers, so we can easily whiz through this, the anatomy of the two. So then the procedure. Um, so let's go into it. So first of all, what I did is I penetrated two millimetres depth in the middle of the tooth using my pear-shaped spur, and I extended it measly 1.5 millimetres. Then I lifted the pear pear-shaped burr um, and place it distally and I penetrated to connect the distal and mesial and occlusal portions of the tooth to really give me my MOD cavity and then after breaking my marginal ridges I deepened the proximal boxes. Cavity design checklist. So proximal occlusal margins have to have a 90 degree cable surface angle with unsupported enamel. That is really specifically to amalgam um, cavities. The axial walls need to converge occlusally to provide retention from vertical displacement. All internal line angles must be smooth. The occlusal portion must be as narrow as possible and the proximal boxes should be sufficiently extended for commingly to allow placement of matrix band. And it's really important to make sure those line angles are rounded. It's really important that there's no damage to adjacent teeth, of course, and the proximal press preparation must have a mesodistal extension of about 1.5 millimeters. So the cavity that I created has converging walls, a 90 degree cable surface angle, smooth internal line angles, and as much narrow sound tube structure was maintained. The, it was a correct buccolingual extension of proximal boxes. However, as I'm critically appraising, so I've shown an area specifically where I thought was too extended, far too buckly. Assemble the matrix band and I placed it in the lower left seven with two wooden wedges. And my clinical partner then processed the amalgam into a Dappens pot and began to condense it. And he placed the amalgam and capsule into the appropriate amalgam waste bins. Then, do we bond or do we not bond amalgam restorations? What does the evidence say? It states that although there are several clinical studies that have demonstrated um, success after several years in practice, there is still a lack of consistent evidence to advocate the benefits of bonding and amalgam. Therefore, using this clinical research for this practical and specifically, I did not bond my amalgam in this situation. I then packed my amalgam with amalgam condenser. I then used a probe, our trusty probe, through the margin of the amalgam and the matrix bands to produce a marginal ridge. I placed a packer over the amalgam whilst gently removing the matrix band to ensure that the amalgam does not fracture or carve the amalgam. In particular, in specifically for a patient, what I would do is I would check the occlusion of the patient so that I then burnished. Should we finish and polish amalgam restorations? What does the evidence say? Polishing a high copper amalgam restoration does not enhance its clinical performance. Finishing usually takes place when restoring the tooth and finishing is usually done at the placement appointment, but it can be refined at further appointments. So there is a lack of evidence to suggest that the performance or longevity is improved when amalgam restoration is polished. However, a high luster is often more comfortable to the patient's tongue than an unpolished surface. Restoration did have an adequate contour and finish. 
thickness and marginal design that will allow it to bear force to the mastication without fracture or deformation. It did have an adequate occlusal gingival depth to essentially resist this fracture. I think the central groove should be placed more buckly. Medial and distally marginal ridges, I think they were okay. In future, I need to finish and polish my restorations. Pre-carb embedding should be done immediately after the completion of the condensation. And the burnisher should be used with heavy stroke. And it's been shown that the, to pre-carb varnishing, it produces denser amalgam at the margin of the restorations, which is great. So in addition to aiding condensation, pre-carb burnishing um, is the first step to shaping the occlusal surface of the restoration. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this clinical skills um, session. And I really enjoyed working with amalgam. Here I have some references. Thank you, Amber, for your submission. I would now like to invite Dr. Shiraz Khan to ask a few questions. Hi, Amber. I hope you're well. Um, a lovely case. Um, this is against what everyone believes about me. I'm not an anti amalgamist. I actually think there's still a place for it. It's a shame that the legislation's coming in because I agree with your indications, actually. That's it's uh it's it's very much a material that's lasted for a long time it's something that should last for a long time but the legislation will change so we'll have to deal with that lovely presentation i was really delighted with the way that you attempted to try and create some anatomy um very very uh, much enjoyed your presentation as well so congratulations to you um what i would ask you is is, is, a, couple, is a couple of things so what when you're restoring the cavity how how are you controlling the interproximal material So in this case, I would have like a matrix band placed on top of the tooth, but in the pictures that didn't show. So um, what I would do, I would hold that in place with maybe like another instrument to make sure that it's well adapted. And um, so I make sure that those interproximal spaces are nicely That's intact. Great. Yeah, yeah. And uh, obviously you want to make sure you wedge it as close as you can so that you're avoiding when you're packing quite hard to avoid any spill out of the material. Um, when you're doing your preparation, is there anything that you could have done to optimize the interproximal or, I, I don't, I wanna ask the question without giving it away. Um, what could you do in the preparation stage to be safe for teeth? Um, in terms of protecting the teeth from each other? Um, yes. yes. Yeah, and um, so you could place something. And um, so some people like to use like a sectional matrix or maybe like, just something there to put in place and um, yeah. maybe like a mylar strip or something to make sure to put a wedge in just to make sure that either side of the teeth are nicely protected. And I think that's something that's really, really important. So in, in clinical practice, we have something fantastic, which is called a wedge guard, which is basically a wedge that's got a metal sheet that goes through the contact point. Um, and it's totally underutilized within practice. Um, I think it's something that's so important. We're all human. Uh, we don't get it perfect all the time. It's such a fine skill. Um, so having some protection there is really, really important. Um, good. Uh, so then talking to your, this is quite a tough question, all right? But I was really interested by your presentation, so don't mind me. When, when talking about bonding, mm -hmm. what would be the ideal bonding substrate to allow your amalgam to bond to the tooth structure? Maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but this is a tough one. So let me ask you. Um, anyway. Are you thinking in terms of bond stress strengths that we're thinking of? Yeah, no. So what there's 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 a specific type of bond. There's this specific element in the bond, in specific bonds that will allow for very very good adhesion between metal and tooth structures. Do you know what that is? Um, I'm not too sure, but um, I've had a hazard a guess. Um, yeah, go for so. It. I, so there's amalga vitra bond, th those, there's th these types of different bonding materials. Um, I'm not entirely sure exactly what it is, but in terms of the strength, you're looking to something like five to 20 micrometers in strength to get as maximum as possible. And I very appreciate you being honest. That's great. If you, uh, listen to everyone, if you don't know something, don't worry about it. Um, the MDP, N, uh, eighth generation bonding systems contain MDP. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a universal substrate, which is great for allowing adhesion from metals to two structures. So Panavia, if you've heard of it, is a um, cement system that allows bonding for a metal wing to enamel surface. So it contains MDP. The patent for that ran out about 10 years ago. And now a lot of bond systems are having MDP containing in their bonds. So you can use great bonding. But again, the evidence shows that actually is it even needed? 
And mm. the argument I would say is, well, if you're going to bond, you need isolation. So you need to use rubber dam or some sort of isolation process, in my opinion. But fantastic work. I mean, I was really I was really impressed with the, your carving. I thought you did a really great job. It was really hard to choose three, but I thought you did amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for answering those questions, Amber. And thank you to all of our finalists for presenting your outstanding clinical abilities. Um, I just wanted to say a big congratulations to Christian, Sven and Amber. I think you all have done very, very distinctly different um, case uh, presentations, very different styles. But unfortunately, there's always one winner. And for me, that winner is going to be Christian. Fantastic work. You did really, really well. Um, absolutely no discredit to the other two because you, you you've both put in a lot of work and, and I was delighted to see how you guys done. But um, what I was really impressed with, Christian, was your inter interdisciplinary planning assessment. Um, fantastic work, great work. But you know what? Because the other two were so fantastic, I think we're going to give runner-up prizes. If that's all right, maybe this isn't part of the plan, gang. Um, but I, I still want to give prizes to Amber and Sven because... They both had done some really, really incredible work. Um, Sven in particular, I thought had some amazing presentation skills. So I look forward to seeing you on the circuit. And Amber was just, you know, her restoration was delightful. So I want to give them prizes as well, if that's okay with you and the team. So congratulations. Well done, Christian. Also well done to the other two as well.